Thanks everybody for uh, coming this morning. It's kind of a strange day for me, I have to say. Uh, I'll get this to move. Uh, so I want to thank and recognize Molly who helped raise the money for this lectureship and also to Vicki for putting things together, making sure the food <laughs> arrived and Gail did all the graphics. A couple of my fellows, uh, Dr. Yoon right here so from Korea and also Dr. Ghazi who's uh, from uh, Turkey helped with the presentation so if it doesn't work you can blame them. Uh, you, probably you're sitting there why, wondering why there's a McFarland professorship. Um, you know, I'm a redneck from Kentucky. I have a little trouble with English. Uh, as you know, I've had a lot of head hits. Uh, my PA will tell you that my memory is fading already. And as you also know, I've got a little potty mouth problem <clears throat> from playing too much football, I think. But the reason there's a lectureship is, uh, that, you know, I trained at Mayo with uh, Steve Peterson and Frank and uh, some others around. And, you know, their emphasis is on taking care of the patient. And hopefully people who work with me get that idea. but. This particular patient was a 65-year-old male who had bilateral shoulder arthritis who had failed all forms of non-operative treatment. He was getting ready to sell his business and retire to Florida. So we did his left total shoulder in 2007 and his right in 2009. And uh, he was a happy camper, satisfied customer, good range of motion. He was able to play golf, work out, you know, tried out a little tennis. So uh, he didn't want the lecture named after himself. So the institution is now cursed. He said, you should name it after Drew. So the institution is now cursed with a McFarland lectureship. So I apologize, but that's how it happened. So I'm actually very proud to have Dr. Leach speak today. Um, he was born and raised in Sanford, Maine, a small little town, a lot like myself. He did two of RC sports at Princeton, uh, wrestling and football. Uh, he met his wife, Laurie, uh, who came with him today, very in back back there, very delightful woman and uh, she, they met in the Jersey Shore and got married in 1955. Uh, she was a, um, <clears throat> she was a, um, uh, what were you doing? You were, uh, she was a waitress. waitress, right. And he was uh, driving a beer truck uh, selling my favorite college beer, Pabst Blue Ribbon. And uh, <laughs> so they went on to have uh, six children and 10 grandchildren. Uh, he went on from there to Columbia Medical School and did his internship and residency at the University of Minnesota, was in the active uh, Navy for three years. Uh, he then went to the Lay Clinic where he was the chairman in uh, 1967. He founded the orthopedic surgery department at Boston University and was the chairman there until 1995. He was the president of the AOSSM in 1984, treasurer of the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery for many years. He was the president of the AOA in 1994. He was an associate editor for CORE, clinical orthopedics. Um, and as you may or may not know, I'm the president of Association of Bone and Joint Surgeons this year, which helps uh, publish clinical orthopedics. <clears throat> he was the head team physician for the U.S. Olympic team from 1980 to 1984. He was the chairman of the Sports Science and Sports Medicine Committee of the U.S. Olympic Committee uh, for many years. He was a team physician for the Celtics for about 20 years. He also uh, uh, worked for the Boston Red Sox, the ski, U.S. ski team, three Boston professional soccer teams, and three universities in Boston. I know that this is not a Boston team. It's all I could find, so. <laughs> uh, he was, um, uh, there's an award given annually by the American uh, AOSSM, American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine, and uh, it's given to the person who's contributed the most to sports medicine, and that award is actually named after Dr. Leach. Uh, he's also in the AOSSM Hall of Fame. <clears throat> he's also, one of the things I love most about him is he's still a tennis player and he still rock climbs. And I'm not going to tell you how old he is, but let's say he's over 70. And uh, even more astonishing is that his wife uh, still plays tennis and about four times a year she competes in USTA events and she's in the top 10 uh, in the nation at her age level. Uh, on, on the other side, uh, Dr. Leach is a father, a grandfather husband and generally a nice guy. Uh, so you might be asking yourself why actually Bob Leach, you know, I'm kind of a shoulder guy these days, <clears throat> but um, he was the editor of the American Journal of Sports Medicine 1990 to 2001. And around 1994 or so, I, we were trying to figure out exactly which meeting it was, but uh, I had just uh, submitted a paper to the American Journal of Sports Medicine and uh, it's one of the first ones uh, that I s submitted uh, from here actually in my young career and it was uh, summarily um, rejected. So I was fairly dejected. 
But I found myself poolside uh, next to Dr. Leach. wasn't intended. We just sort of ended up next to each other. So um, over a couple pina coladas, I was talking to him about why, you know, my paper got rejected. I couldn't understand it because, you know, it obviously was brilliant work. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, he said, well, you know, you know, I'll tell you what, send, send me, uh, let me take a look at it and I'll get back to you and see if it can be sort of massaged and what we can do. So, <clears throat> he, uh, so I, he sent me some ideas and I redid it and sent it into him and they had it re-reviewed and it was accepted. And, um, and it sounds kind of silly, but it really made me realize that when you do research, you know, you always want everything to be perfect and you think it's great. And, but really the reality of anybody here who's tried to publish, you know, it usually gets beat up a lot along the way. And, um, and so uh, it sort of uh, stimulated me to continue to want to try to work the system and figure out how to get things published. And, and I feel like I've done a pretty good job with the fellows and the residents and all the people who've worked with us. But <clears throat> it's kind of strange that, you know, a moment like that sort of changes your career. And uh, so for that, I am still to this day uh, thankful to him for helping me out and sort of helped me find, uh, get through the weeds uh, to uh, a successful, successful career. It's an interesting thing about that, I was talking to Dr. Gasgari uh, yesterday, uh, last night at dinner, and ends up that Dr. Leach did the same thing for him when, when he had a paper that early in his career he couldn't quite figure it out. Dr. Leach uh, took the time and the effort to help guide both of us in our careers and help us under, understand how to be uh, successful in terms of writing and things. Uh, so this summer I found myself again sitting next to Dr. Leach. It was at the editor's meeting for the American Journal of Sports Medicine. Uh, so we're all on the editorial board, as is uh, Dr. Gary, I think. And, um, and uh, so I was sitting next to him and uh, we were talking about all the things in life that were important. And, uh, and I thought, you know, who better to speak to us uh, in this group, in our department, at this point in our lives, except somebody who has the perspective and the wisdom uh, and the knowledge that he has. One of my previous uh, fellows from uh, Korea quoted uh, uh, an old Buddhist saying that every breath you can't have back. And uh, you know, we're not really wired to think about every day and every moment and every breath, but really I think uh, we probably should think of it a lot more. Uh, but anyway, so Dr. Leach is gonna speak to us today about things that are important in life and uh, what it, what's meant the most to him in his career and hopefully give us some guidance on uh, how to, how to uh, move forward and how to be successful in our lives and our careers. So uh, if you can put him up there, sure. Dr. Leach. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Ed, I uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And I do want to tell you that the tickets that you gave Laurie and I to go to Paris before we accepted that paper were really appreciated. <laughs> so, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here at Johns Hopkins University, and uh, I really do mean that. I have spoken in Baltimore several times in my life, but never at this particular institution. But I do want you to know that even as a young man, I was aware of the excellence of Hopkins. I trained at Columbia in New York, and the predominant teacher there was a man named Dr. Robert Lerb, who was the co-author of Cecil and Lerb. And he was, often gave pronouncements. And one of the pronouncements that he often gave was this. There is no good medicine practice west of the Hudson, except, of course, at Johns Hopkins. So at least I was inculcated rather early on with the excellence of Johns Hopkins. The title, Why Not Success? I labored over this. It looks pretty simple. Basically, everybody in this room is working hard, and many of you, the younger people, will in fact work harder. I know you don't believe that, but you will in fact work harder. If you're going to do that, you might as well be successful. And I have a definition of that. And so my concept today is I'd like to try to give you a little bit of information that may or may not help you. The attainment of popularity of profit. That's the first definition. I don't like that really, you know. It's kind of, I don't know, money grabbing if you will. The accomplishment of an aim or purpose. I like that. You're looking at the midshipmen at Annapolis and obviously they've attained their aim, they're graduating, and they've added something else to it because they got all those caps in the air and they're very happy with what they've done. 
And for me, I define success as living a happy and productive life. Schweitzer was a famous man back in 40s, 50s, 60s. He won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1962 for his medical work in Gabon. And he said, success does not lead to happiness, but happiness does lead to success. So at least I'm not alone. I'm going to touch on success in three separate areas. Being a successful orthopedic surgeon, no surgery, know how to treat people. At the request of Dr. McFarland, a little bit about medical publishing. And finally, the coexistence of a successful family like with orthopedic practice. These points will come from my own orthopedic life and from my personal life, all of which are fairly long. It's a very personal interpretation. By the way, when people say I, he can get, deal in perspective, that means you're old. <laughs> Finally, while I realize that my medical practice is different from what you have, the basic characteristics of people remain the same, and they do over the ages, over the centuries, meaning you may learn from the past. If we hadn't had the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk in 1903, would we, would we have had the jumbo jets that we all fly in? You are the chosen, a quote from the Torah. Why the chosen? You're intelligent or you wouldn't be here. You're privileged. And I see some people going, oh, why? I don't mean you're rich. I don't mean that someone made it easy. But you are here. And that means you have relative job security coming up. You're in a great specialty. You have a chance to heal patients. As such, you have a very big job to do. And I'm hoping I can give you a few things to help you along the way. In my opinion, success basically is dealing effectively with people. It will be the one aspect of life which will be the difference between you having a degree of success or a degree of failure. People cause problems. People solve problems. I wish there were more solvers than causers. In my opinion, in my life, it was not true. But the fact is, we deal with people. We must recognize that from our aspect, a particular problem may appear one way, but for others, it may be quite different. And we must, at times, put ourselves in the other person's perspective. I don't believe that failure has to be the best teacher. However, it is often remembered because it is so painful, and thus it does become effective. However, success should teach us, and we should be able to learn not only from our own success, but from others. We would like, if we could, to avoid failure to some extent. Can't avoid it forever. Experience can be a great teacher, provided the experience is valid. If you learn how to do something in surgery that's the wrong way, that's not good experience. Learn how to hit your backhand the wrong way, that's not experience. If you've gotten by in the OR by yelling and screaming for two years, soon you will find out that that is not good experience. I experienced early failure without question. Left the Navy, major clinic in Boston, newest, youngest, most productive member after about a year and a half, both academically and in patients. After three years, I was made chair. Actually, I thought I deserved it. I'd worked hard, thought I was a nice person. There's a certain amount of hubris in that, isn't it? I did not realize how deeply wounded some of the other department members were gonna be. They were all older, they'd all been there younger. One in particular. I needed to understand their adverse responses and to reach out effectively, and I did not. My people skills at that time were minimal. Over in the corner there, you see me when I was a child in Sanford, Maine. Did have a little learning disability, I guess. I first looked at problems when I was at Leahy as how they might affect me. And for solutions to my liking, not necessarily for the Department of Clinic. Now, a lot of times they did, but I was looking first for what I thought. I thought I could do all of this without consultation. After all, I was 36 years old. I'd worked hard. Certain amount of hubris there. I found personal confrontation difficult. One of the doctors, the one who thought he would be chief, wrote me a letter immediately after I was named, said, I will no longer take part in the resident teaching, and I will no longer talk with you. I thought that was asinine then. I still do. 
So I went right over to his office, and he basically threw me out. As I was walking out, I thought, hmm, I'm mature. I'll handle this. I'll wait him out. The resident thing was easy because I told him, if you don't take part in the teaching, you don't get him to help you in surgery. The other lasted four to five months. And finally, one day, I thought, good Lord, how childish, both on his part and mine, to not get this settled. And I went over, and I got it settled. You know, we never came buddies, but we got it done. I procrastinated, I lost time, and I lost energy. Well, these lessons can be learned and can be used anywhere, but it's too bad to have to learn them that way. An iconic figure. He does not look like the sort of man who one would invite out for a beer in the afternoon. Yet, when I read about him some years ago, one of the things that they wrote about was he came to the hospital and for the first five or six weeks, he spent all the time in the hospital, day and night, because he wanted to meet the people, learn the names, and find out what they did. He was, in fact, a people person. So maybe have a glass of wine with him now. In any event, he was interested in people. Civility is a word that I'll bet no one in this room has used for a long time. It's kind of disappeared. Now, I'm not talking about things like Emily Post, where you use the right fork, or taking your hat off in the elevator, although I'm not against that, etc. I'm talking about how you treat people. We should treat everybody as individuals, not titles or jobs. I know there are doctors, security guards, technicians, etc., but they're all people, and they all deserve the dignity of being talked with, not to. We should learn and use the names of the people we work with. I'll be honest, I did this when I was at BU. I knew almost everybody that I came in contact with. And to be very frank, it was good. You treat others as you would like to be treated. Very simple. Be nice, learn the names, and treat them well. By the way, these people can make your life easier and make life easier for your patients. A quick word on patients. We all know we're supposed to be nice to patients. Patients come to doctor's offices and they're fearful. Majority of you in this room are not old enough to actually go to a doctor and be worried about something. I am. I'm a reasonably intelligent person and I'm in pretty good health now. And yet, each time I go to the doctor's office, I'm a little bit scared because I'm afraid they'll find something. And a lot of times that interferes with their ability to understand you. Spend a little bit of extra time. Squabbles, that's, they're called trivial quarrels. They occur in all aspects of life, clinic, hospital, etc. Patient access, compensation, the fact that you root for the wrong football team, any of these can cause squabbles. The problem with squabbles is they escalate. You need to solve them early on. They must be solved or they will fester and they will go up and sometime there may be a volcanic fester. Communication is the key. We use email a lot. It's kind of easy. That, 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 boom, you send it off. Nicely impersonal. Don't touch your fingers to it. You know, that's, it's done. I did it. I'm, you know, it's done. No, no, no. It's not really that good. Phone calls are good. You're talking on the phone. But you don't get quite the same feel as when you're doing it face to face. So when there are squabbles, it just seems to me that you have to communicate and it has to be face to face and nip it in the bud if you can't, because if you don't, it then becomes the dispute, which is sort of on the way up. A lot of times, I settle disputes because I was chief or chairman or whatever. And many of you are thinking, well, it doesn't apply to me because I'm probably not going to be the chairman of such and such a university. But many of you will run departments, sections, committees, et cetera, where you are, in fact, in charge of people, and you have to solve it. Good to. See it coming? Act preemptively. That's very good. If you're in the middle of it, who are the adversaries? Oftentimes, if you're the chief or in the head of the committee, you're one of them. You have to define the issues. By the way, you may think it's one issue and someone else may think it's actually somewhat different. Find out. Talk with the people. Sometimes alone, sometimes as a group, but talk with them Get it done. Don't hide in the academic closet. Don't hide because you're in charge. Talk with people. Make a decision. Then everybody should be told 
what the decision is and why you made it. Now they may think that's the dumbest reason I've ever heard, but at least you've given a reason and they'll know at least that you're dumb. But you've got to let them know what it's doing. Finally, looking at disputes, don't think of them as victory or defeat. Think of it as resolving the issue. Now I do understand, I'm not that dumb, that somebody who's gotten what they want will think, ha ha, I won. But the fact of the matter is, particularly if you're running things, you've got to see it as resolving the issue. On your right, this book was written by George Orwell, famous author of 1984. It's entitled The Road to Wigan Pier. Wigan is a coal mining town in England. A pier is like a coal silo, if you will. It's about 40 years. Highest infant mortality, highest maternal mortality. Kids under 12 were still working in the mines in 1915-16. Not a place particularly marked for success. Why bring it up? My father was born and brought up in Wigan. He and his family left after the first great war. He was about 12 or 13, he came to the New World, Nova Scotia, Cape Breton Island, the very top were their coal mines, because that's what they knew. His mom died about two months after he arrived. And yet somehow, over the course of the years, my father came to the United States, and by the time I had gotten to college and medical school, he had become a very successful textile person. When I got mature enough to understand just how well my dad did, I asked him, how did you do so well? My dad is on the right over there, two brothers and his father. He said, I feared returning to life as in Wigan, a driving force, and many of us, probably most of us, have a driving force. I like people and I treat them well and they reciprocate. For every Harvard or Yale graduate in the room, that means they pay back. And I make decisions in a timely manner. Decisions. As surgeons, we are supposed to make decisions, and yet we've all scrubbed with someone who really had trouble making decisions. Not the best thing, but in other parts of life, it's terrible because it paralyzes everything. <clears throat> everything stops. You have to have enough input to define the issue then you may need help, unless you're like I was when I was an early chief. You may have to discuss it, and finally you mull over the issue. But get it done, get the information, get it going. Make a decision and live with it. Now, my dad pointed out that he made some wrong decisions, but things kept going. Sometimes he had to go east when he was originally going north. The fact is, it keeps things going. Now, you don't want to be constantly changing your mind, but at least if you make a decision, Things don't stop. <clears throat> Adapting. During my orthopedic career, open metastectomy became arthroscopic. Copper arthroplasty was total hips. Individual payments were Medicare and then HMOs. We had secretaries who then were entitled administrative assistants and then disappeared. I went to Boston as a hand surgeon. Went to City Hospital and became known as a trauma surgeon. And somehow I ended up as a sports medicine something or other. We must adapt, whether it's at the ether dome or doing arthroscopy, because, as Heraclitus said somewhere around 500 BC, <clears throat> the only constant is change. We don't want to be making buggy wicks when they're putting out cars. So we have to look at what's new. What does it mean to us, my associates? How do we deal with it? By the way, bitching is not adapting. Bitching is bitching. It takes time and energy, and you need energy to live a successful and happy life. You really do. You consider the situation, respond as best you can, and make a decision. A wonderful adaptation failure. In the early 1950s, the AMA was adamantly opposed to Medicare. Ads, money spent, talking to Congress, everybody. Oh, it really worked well. They alienated the public. They alienated the Congress, and they alienated virtually all of the young doctors who were in medical school at the time, who never really felt good about AMA after that. Adapt. Understand when there are things you can fight. Understand when you can't, but be ready to move forward. One of the things that you must do as an orthopedic surgeon is constantly hone your skills. 
read the journals, pick out what you need, what you feel you don't know. Can't read everything, I know that. You skim some. Go to certain meetings, ones that will benefit you. I do understand there are wonderful golf courses in Hawaii. But if I'm chief, don't go there and come back and tell me how much medical stuff you learned. So pick your meetings carefully. Pick out what you might need to learn. The skills courses are out there, they're terrific. There are people who you can go visit who will tell you how to do things. Dr. Robert Jackson was one of my closest friends. He is credited by most of us as bringing arthroscopy to North America. Came to Boston in 67, was on my tail for months to make me start doing arthroscopy. I bought two of those miserable wolf sculpts, broke one in the knee of a Boston Celtic ball player, never got over it, managed to get it out, but went up to him in Toronto, and he used to have all sorts of people coming up. There are people like that. Jim Andrews will do that. By the way, the other man is Frank Bassett, who some of you will know, who is certainly one of the founders in sports medicine, was a wonderful person at Duke. Go to the anatomy lab if you can't figure something out. Work it out there. It's better than doing it on the patient. When I hadn't done a surgery or was doing something new, I would frequently, the night beforehand, do, visualize it in my mind, and I would literally make the skin incision, get the bleeders, do that, go through the fascia, do, you know, do it all the way through. If you're not sure, do it. it. Makes it a lot easier. You look a lot better. You know, sometimes you just have to reflect, reconsider. My wife says I reinvented myself a number of times. Circumstances do change. You may hit a dead end. You may look somewhere else and the grass really is greener. The timing might be good. So think. Rodin's famous sculpture, The Thinker. Explore, then think again. Don't be afraid to make change or investigate change. You have the tools. You're the chosen. But you've got the possibilities of doing this. So don't be afraid of looking at something new. You may not always want to do what you do. Orthopedic surgeons become deans, become editors, become a variety of things, but people in practice do too. One of the brightest residents I ever had is now working with the academy on all of the payment systems and so forth. He's a brilliant man who's doing very good work. Well, we're getting at the end of this particular section. I hope I'm speaking to the, or bringing Coles to Newcastle. So you physically active. You live longer and you live healthier throughout that time. You have more energy, you have more fun. I have no idea why everybody doesn't do this. I understand all of the excuses, and they are that excuses. Don't tell me you can't do it in residency. I ran to the hospital. Don't tell me you can't do it when you're a busy staff man. You do it later at night. You can do it if you want to. So whether you're this little kid skiing on the front lawn or the lady here hitting a tennis ball or this climber who's doing a heinous rock climb, stay active. Well, that's part one. While I have a drink here, I want you to look at that wonderful Pacific Ocean and change gears. And as per Dr. McFarland, we're going to talk a little bit about publishing. Or not. I understand there are people here who have no interest. But hang with it. Maybe you'll have a little bit of interest. Why should you publish? You have good material, and you have a message which you think would be good for orthopedics. It would be interesting, and it is. It's fun. You learn things. I mean, learning's great, isn't it? Particularly when you're not being graded. I didn't feel like quite that way when I was a junior in college. But the fact is, it's fun. It might advance your career. Most times when you write an article and people learn about it, they have a certain respect. They feel, you know, it, it goes well. That's nice. Ego satisfaction. Well, you know, most of us have an ego. Actually, we all have an ego, but some it's more advanced than others. Fact is, it's good. Our program mandates. Now, I put that in red, like it's bad. No, it's not bad. There have been many very good articles written because the section chief or the head of the department or something said, you got to do this paper, this is what I'd like you to do. And they help them out, and the pub paper comes out. may not be bad. It may be very good. And... Some of those people who would otherwise never have done a paper all of a sudden say, you know, I can do this. What do you do? Well, you pick a topic. Maybe your section chief or somebody says, this is a good topic. Or you notice you have eight patients with such and such. Or it's something that always interested you. You research it. That's fun. You're learning for learning's sake. I used file cards, wrote the, what I was researching. I wrote everything down. I had those, went back. 
then determine the message. Otherwise, if you have a whole bunch of material, data, numbers, etc., it's a mishmash of stuff. It doesn't mean anything. There must be a message. If it doesn't have a message, it's not going to be published. If it has a message, it has a good chance. Get a message. Deliver it well. Send it to the appropriate journal. As an editor, we all know concise is better than long. Eight pages is easy. Four pages is very hard. But it's a lot better. Well written, Curry's favor the reviewers. Remember, the reviewers are doing it, and they then advise the editor, and he usually acts upon their advice. So it's the reviewers you're writing for. Follow the usual rules. Don't remake the wheel. Sometimes people do. I never figure it out. Pay close attention to figures, charts, numbers. Sometimes the reviewer will write, he said he had 100 patients. 90 did well. 18 did poorly. Harvard grads, that's 108, that's too many. So then you send that back to the author, and somehow those eight patients disappear. I've never figured it out. Do they die? Do they say, I don't want to be in that paper, or what happens? And of course, you as the editor and the reviewer kind of, I don't know about that one. So make sure. Bibliography, current, relevant, correct. Make sure it's correct, because people will read it, and some will say, I'm sorry, that was in 1924, not 1934. Make sure you do it. Finally, conclusions must be drawn from the results in the paper. You may know in your heart of hearts, in your brain of brains, that yes, this is what will happen because of this. But if you haven't proved it from the results, you can't put it in the conclusions. It will be, it'll be crossed out or it will not be accepted. It must be drawn from the results. Best book ever published to help people write. Why not say it clearly? A little bit of a book by Lester King, best thing the AMA ever did. He was with the AMA. And it, for those of you who are younger, and all of you who are older, whatever that is, it's a very good book that will help you do medical writing. That last draft, if you're at Har Harvard, Hopkins, Yale, whatever, the Mayo Clinic, there are people who help. They say, yes, we'll edit it. No, no, no. They may edit it but you do the last draft. It's your paper. I found it effective to read it out loud. Sometimes I would be reading and think, oh, golly, I can't believe I said that. I said that a page ago, or that's not what I meant. You do it. Grammar, spelling, punctuation. The reviewers notice all that. The better it looks to them, the more likely they are. Pick the proper journal. Of course, I hope that you'll use the Journal of Sports Medicine if it's on that subject. Follow the instructions, otherwise it'll take you six months to even get it reviewed because you screwed up. Follow the instructions. <laughs> Publishing integrity. I kind of hate to bring that up in a place like Hopkins, which has such a wonderful reputation. But you might know some other people that you could help. Quotes are fine. Plagiarism, obviously not. Plagiarism, if you take a two-sentence thing out of someone else's work and you rearrange four words, and you don't put quotes and you don't attribute, that's plagiarism. Now, we have people who actually do full paragraphs. I've seen almost pages. It's obviously bad. Don't invent data. Unfortunately, I'm sure you've all read it various times. We have a lot of medical writing up in Boston, and the Globe puts a lot of things in every time someone screws up. And, you know, be prepared to defend your data. There may be someone who says, I just don't believe this guy who's been there 22 months has 148 cases of something I've spent my whole life and I have 13. Don't add author's names, even if he's a good friend and he's kind of looked at it. If he's really helped and done things, sure. I do not like it myself when the chairman of a department says everything that comes out of here has my name on it. If he suggested the topic, worked on it, and went all the way through, sure. But not just because he's chief, but some people feel differently. Sending in somebody else's work, you're all thinking, how could you do that? Very easy. You work at Clinic A and you have 18 patients. You go now to Clinic B and you get three more. Ah, I have a study of 21 patients. I'll write this up. No. You get in touch with Clinic A, talk about them and see. Maybe they will say, fine. I had that happen a minimum of five or six times when I was the editor. Sending to two or more journals, endemic. You know, you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes in the academic world. It's not that big. You know, let me think about it. It's really not that big. 
So if you got something and it's, you know, posterior dislocations to the shoulder, you send it to Ed McFarlane, and another journalist got something on posterior dislocations to the shoulder, and it goes to Ed McFarlane, and he writes me back and says, by the way, I reviewed this about four days ago for another journal. Not good. Because once you make that step over into the bad world, it's not good for you. Revisions, good. Likely they'll accept. Do them timely, pay attention, or negotiate. If you choose to negotiate, make darn sure you know what you're saying and try to understand their point of view. Now, I don't know how most of you would be, but I never responded particularly well to the letter that started, Dear Stupid Editor. Probably those people did not get that paper published. But be aware that the revisions probably are good and by people who are very good. Manuscript errors. Don't tell the editor that would never have gotten there. I don't know how that got in there. You got in there because you put it there or you didn't pick it up. And that always gives that feeling, oh gosh, I don't know about this person. So don't do that. Well, it's published. Like the little girl, dance up and down, have a cup of tea, bubbly, whatever, and say good. Feel good, because it is good. That's nice, that's really great. I remember my first paper that was published. It was in the Navy, it was in the JBJS. Oh my gosh, I can remember that. I taught, you know, I told my wife, I said, you know, Stockholm, here I come. All I gotta do is learn Swedish. And it just was so exciting. So I hope some of you will do that. A little bit later, look at it. Could it have been better? Of course it could. All of them could be better. Try to figure it out. Reviewing, my or in here for me, Ed and others, is a good way to learn how to write better. Really look at it as you're reviewing and think of what you might do. Well, many people have something to say. Frankly, few say it. By the way, most significant work is done by young people. Define young. I can't. I know I'm not. But by the way, most work is done by young people. So what I'd like you to do is run out of the room right now and get to work on a paper. Well, we're now in section three. Everything is coming up roses. We're going to talk about family. My wife and I have been married a long time. We have a good partnership. After the kids left and went to college, she started traveling with me more, going to medical meetings, and she would sometimes call, come to the meeting and listen to me talk. That's a picture taken of her. <laughs> I guess she'd heard that talk beforehand. Family is hugely important for all of us. Some of us do it better than others. That's my family a year ago at a significant birthday. By the way, Yankee refers to the bus line and to people who live up north, not to that team in New York, which you don't like any better than I do. I think when you're speaking, you should have a CV. So here's my family CV, part of which Ed showed you. Married Laurie in 55, six children. The picture is a couple years later. We moved seven times, but Boston became home and still is. Stayed employed. By 77, we were out of debt. That's pretty good. Had two kids in college and four more to go. From then on, all I had to do was work, enjoy, and stay lucky, and I was lucky. 2013, same wife, same house, a lot more grandchildren. I understand your family is unique. Yet, some of the actions which you apply do apply to all, even though times have changed, even though it's different today than it was 12 years ago, 20 years ago, et cetera. I'm not going to tell you that we were perfect and solved our problems, because we did not, but we did try. We tried very hard. What works for one family may not work for another, but it may be of some value to consider concepts. I very much believe that time is the major issue. Nobody has enough time for work or family. Time spent with whom? Doing what? Most of us seem to feel that the work must be done. Therefore, if we don't have enough time, we reach over here and we bring it here, and then the next time we reach over here and we bring it here. You all know what is over here. And you think, well, Jeanette has seven home games. I've only missed three. I'll get the next four. You might. You might not. The one thing which I do know 
is each opportunity lost is gone forever. The quote that Ed had up there is similar to that. They are gone. As you get to later years, and that's where I am, you have family, friends, and reputation. You know from recent events the last couple of years that reputations go easily. Friends die, move away. Family's there. So family is critical. When you read about families, everybody always talks about communication and love. Communication between spouses and with children. You must communicate. It's not always easy. I understand. We had six kids, so I'm not, you know, a virgin in this area. This means talking and not dictating. Some of us who are in charge of things a lot have a tendency to dictate. We must talk. We must praise. I'm surprised at how many times our kids will refer to things when I praise them rather than criticizing them. Now, I understand kids make a lot of mistakes. Ours did. Fortunately, they had a father who was perfect and could pick up all those mistakes. So think about praising. Love, movies, books, pictures, etc. It's not an abstract entity. It's something that's concrete and it has to be demonstrated repetitively. Nothing too little, nothing too big. It's there, and if you don't recognize it and don't deal with it, you're not too bright. In my mind, I feel married couples must have the same goals. One's going north and one's going south. You either end up going east or you continue on those roads, which means planning is essential. Now, we plan for everything else. We've got to plan for our families and things we do. It is different today than when Laurie and I were married. I understand that. Responsibilities must be agreed upon, and parenting is a two-person job. The fact is you've got to agree upon it and you've got to plan, because if you don't, Squabbles become disputes, and disputes escalate, and bad things happen. I'm sure you're all aware that in divorce actions, finances are the most mentioned. I thought it might be other things, but it turns out finances are the most mentioned. Everybody moans and groans. That means money management must be by both partners. It has to be. Spouses must listen. All spouses talk. Certainly I did, and did. But it's nice to have spouses listen. And that's what you really have to do. You have to listen. Problems occur, of course. Solve them. That's what, you know, problems there, solve it. You would do that if your car wasn't working. Do it when your family's not working. I sometimes thought of family as kind of minor crisis management every day. The key is to keep it minor. The key is to take care of it each day and not let them escalate. I'm not an authority in divorce, I don't want to be. By the way, surgeons have a somewhat lower rate. Hoorah for us. But it's painful, crippling, unless you're the lawyer, time consuming, and emotional consequences. Therefore, it would seem to me it would be very good to avoid divorce and to work hard at that. I understand surgeons have all these things they have to do. You're not unique, though. You're unique in the sense you're orthopedic surgeons. Professions and businesses have all sorts of demands made on them. And we know people in professions, businesses, and surgeons who find time for family and for friends and for other things. Why, if he can do it, can't he do it? If she can do it, why can't he do it? The fact of the matter is we know that they're there. It's part of our lives. Just do it. There are a few things that work for us. I brought a lot of work home. Came into the house, had dinner with my wife, usually with the kids, and then I went to the den and I worked, but I was around. We attended kids' activities and sports. She attended more than I did, but I attended a lot. By the way, it's a lot of fun, isn't it? I heard Ed talking about something he did. Husband and wife, free time. We found that was a very big aspect. Whether it was a movie, a meal, an occasional vacation, usually connected with medicine, to be candid. But it was free time alone. And we found that was rekindling. Sometimes we're able to solve some things that were not as easy when everybody was around. We camped, we played tennis, and we skied together. 
At this age, many of the stories that are told by the kids are about those activities and all the things that they remember, and usually all with good thoughts. You notice those are all time-related. Come back to that. We had a budget. That was pretty easy because we didn't have any money for a long time. I'm older, and some of you know some of the salaries that were paid at that time. When we went to the Navy, we thought we were, I thought I was Rockefeller. We discussed the income, the monthly expenses, et cetera, et cetera. We had separate bank accounts. We even had the kids there. Sometimes that was funny. Sometimes I thought they were annoying. But it's interesting. Our kids are all good money managers. I have no idea it's because we had those budget discussions. But the fact that six out of six handle their money well might be. Nothing there is earth shattering. I understand that. But we did it. So from that point of view, it's very good that we did it. Life requires work. Being a good surgeon, good skier, being a good resident requires work. Why in the dickens would we think that having a good marriage, a good family would not require work? Of course it does. The hope is, as hard as the people who are working here in surgery, that the couple that just got married on the other side will work hard and at the end of 25 years be as happy then as they are on this very special day. So you really do have to work. Well, we're at the end. So to look back, happiness is integral to success. People skills are essential, and communication skills aid and abet people skills. Making decisions moves life ahead. Adapting is a fundamental task at all stages. Hopefully, writing and publishing a paper is not a mystery. And it takes work to have a happy marriage and family, and it is well worth the work. So, I hope you will learn from the past, that you will look to the future, but do not lust for it. Otherwise, you will miss all the days between now and the future. I want you to live in the present each and every day. At the end of a talk, it's frequent that the speaker will give you the key to his success, so I will give you the key to my success. And she's sitting somewhere up in the back, and I have high hopes that she's not as bored as she was in that first picture I did. <laughs> uh, I do want to thank you all. It's a great honor to be the first McFarland lecturer. It's a pleasure. A particular thanks to Jonathan who picked me up, to Vicki, and to everybody else who was so nice to help me out, and uh, I really appreciate it. I wish you success in your future endeavors in life. Bye-bye.